The year was 1954. The Supreme Court of the United States had unanimously struck down segregation in public schools. That was the new law of the land. But laws don't change hearts. They just reveal them. So the actual outworking of this ruling, of this new law, was slow, and in most cases it was non-existent. Angry backlash, fearful resistance was the normative response throughout our nation, particularly here in the South. Even a decade later, in 1964, over 98% of black children still attended segregated schools. There are all kinds of stories about the first to desegregate schools from that point forward. Probably some of you know, could have been your parents, could have been your grandparents, could have been a, a close friend. I know one of my close friends and mentors, Pastor Brett Fuller, who pastors our Every Nation Church in D.C., talks about how he desegregated his school when his family moved to a new neighborhood. There are all kinds of stories about the first black student or students to integrate a particular school all the way up to the last one that was desegregated in 2016. However, the most well-known accounts of school desegregation are that of the Little Rock Nine that happened on November 14th, 1957, and then Ruby Bridges three years later. It was November 14th, 1960, when six-year-old Ruby Bridges integrated her school in New Orleans, accompanied by her mom, federal marshals. And she said that she thought the crowds were yelling because it was Mardi Gras as she was entering school. Ruby did not actually attend class that day because nobody else came to school. No students, no teachers, all were protesting except one. One teacher came to school that day. Her name was Barbara Henry. When the students finally returned to school, they were kept separate from Ruby. So when Barbara Henry, whom Bridges said was the first white teacher and the nicest teacher she ever had, taught a class, it consisted of only Ruby, and she did so for the entire school year. But get this, it was just the next school year that Ruby attended classes with both black and white students all in the same classroom together without incident. How? Because in this case, two people, one black, one white, Ruby and Miss Henry, were willing to cross an imaginary dividing line that at least legally, externally, did not exist anymore. And they were willing to cross the line. Why do I mention this story? Well, in light of our text this morning, which we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, I want us to see that the hostility that Jesus had to kill on the cross between us and God and then us and one another is a battle that started and has been going on really since the fall of humanity. As a matter of fact, historians, if biblically speaking, say that at the time that Jacob went one way and then Esau went another, that was the beginning of the divide, if you will, of Jew and Gentile, one that Paul was addressing, one that we still, still deal with to this day all over the world, wherever there is division or separation because of ethnicity or background or nation or tribe or tongue. And so in this battle, what we see and what we have to continue to to do until Christ returns is as a church, we have to display unity and diversity if we're going to not just believe but embody what Christ has done for us on the cross. See, even the demons believe, but only those who truly believe embody, live out what we say we believe. If Christ suffered and died on the cross, then certainly we can still cross the lines of division today. 
Let's rewind a few thousand years then to the time when Jesus drew his final breath on the cross. And as it says in Matthew 27, 51, that he said, it is finished. And at that moment, the veil that separated us from God, us between the Holy of Holies, the presence of God that we sang about this morning that goes with us today, that veil that separated us was torn from top to bottom. And at the same time, the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 14, which we already looked at tells us that the wall that separated Gentiles and the Jews in the temple had to come down as well. The reconciled people of God would now be one people of God worshiping together the same Lord. So think with me if you would. I wonder what that first worship service in Antioch was like. What was it like at the temple that day? Did everybody show up? Or did some people stay home and protest? Did everybody come to worship God together? Or did some people say, I'm going to just do something else? Who was the first Gentile that actually stepped beyond the old line where the wall used to be separating the Jews and the Gentiles in this first combined worship service? Who was the first Jewish person at the door, if you will, on the hospitality team that welcomed that Gentile into the worship service because not because they were enemies any longer, but because they were brothers and sisters in Christ? What did it look like? I'm not sure what it looked like or how it played out, but I know in that church being established in Antioch and beginning to send people out into the nations, I do know that things were different. Things had to change because legally through the blood of Jesus, the law had changed. And now the dividing line, the walls of hostility had been separating them before had come down. And I also know this, in the words of Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, it takes two to make things go right. Relationships are a two-way street. So when the walls of hostility come down legally through the blood of Jesus, when the curtains are removed, when all the barriers that we would put up and all the barricades that we would set up around us to separate ourselves are gone, somebody has to be willing to cross the invisible line of division that may be gone in the physical and in the external, but still exists in the internal, in the heart. Somebody has to allow themselves to be crucified on the inside and cross the line in the name of Jesus and it takes more than one maybe you've heard that saying cross the line in conjunction with something negative well you done crossed the line there buddy now it's on or you crossed the line there now you're going to get grounded or whatever the case may be but as Christians listen to me there are lines that we must cross There are walls that we must continue to pull down. There are divides that we must continue to close. Divisions we must continue to heal. And when it comes to what Jesus has done for us to be one and what the enemy continues to do to divide us, we as believers, the church in the earth today, must take a step of faith, pull down every principality and stronghold that would try to exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ and in Jesus' name ask the body of Christ cross the line. It's in the name of Jesus that we cross every dividing line in the church in order to be one people that he's called us to be. To that end, Paul starts to give us some detailed instructions of how we're going to actually do that, how we're going to walk that out, how that's going to look as Christians, as believers. So that's what we're going to look at in our text for this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. And I mentioned in week one of this series that the whole letter to the Ephesians is a combination of the church's position in Christ and then the church's practice because of that. It's Christian doctrine and Christian duty and faith in Christ and how we actually live out that faith in Christ. So the first three chapters dealt with doctrine. This is who you are. 
This is who you are in Christ. This is what you have received. This is the riches of the inheritance that you have in Christ. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. These are the things we've talked about the first few weeks. All of that in the first three chapters. That's the doctrine. Now we get into the responsibilities in light of that doctrine. This is the walk part of sit, walk, and stand. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. We walk this out now in Christ, and we stand in the power of the resurrection. Sit, walk, stand. Now this is the walking. Walking out our faith through verifiable actions is what Paul is saying, and he's exhorting us towards these actions in these verses. And for all of our hyper-individualism that we often deal with, what we're going to find again and again, we've said this numerous times, is that the power that we're supposed to walk in and stand in, that we're created to live in, is only functional as the unified church. It's just idealistic if it's just me. It's only functional when it's me and you actually working this out together. It's we not just me, are to be radically reconciled people of God. Reconciled to him and reconciled to one another. So this first walk in the spirit, if you will, that Paul addresses is the walk of unity. The walk of unity. So yeah, we talk about unity all the time. It sounds a bit repetitive. It is. I don't know what else to tell you about the gospel except that it's super repetitive about what it's supposed to create in the body of Christ. And because we haven't got it yet, because we're not living it out yet, because we haven't figured it out to the point of actually living it out fully yet, we're going to keep repeating it just as Paul was repeating it, just as I'm repeating it, just as you will repeat it as long as you live and are serving and loving Jesus. Over and over and over again till we don't just repeat it, but we actually live it. So let's read our text, starting in verse 1. Most translations, it starts out, therefore I, as a prisoner for the Lord. In this case, in the NIV, it says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Lord, we thank you for your word. Change us from the inside out. I want you to notice an important word at the beginning of this verse. As I said, in most translations it says therefore, and we've said this before, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you wanna know what it's there for. Yeah, yeah, there, there you go. You should remember that for the rest of your life. What's that there for? Why is it there? So he's saying then because of, in the NIV, then because of this, or in the other translations, therefore because of this, it's in order to connect that Paul is basing these exhortations that he's about to give us, that he's about to drop on us, what he has just taught in the previous three chapters. I'm about to exhort you to do this because of what I've just taught you of who you are. This is super important. Based on the doctrines of the first three chapters of Ephesians, here is your Christian duty. Here is your Christian responsibility. And here's why. Sound doctrine must precede righteous behavior. Don't tell me it doesn't matter what you believe. You want to know why sound doctrine matters? Because you can't be ignorant about what you believe and the truth of God's word and then hope to live righteously. You can't. You can't say, well, it really doesn't matter about all that doctrine stuff and all what we believe. I just got to treat people well. Here's the truth. You will not treat people well if you do not believe the truth of God's word. At least not for very long. And the reason why is you, what you believe determines how you behave. About anything and anybody. What you believe about your car, what you believe about oxygen, what you believe about air conditioning, what you believe about power, what you believe about people, all of those things determine how you behave with all of those situations. And it's the same with Jesus, it's the same with his word, it's the same with doctrine, what we believe about what the Bible says, what it teaches, what you believe determines how you behave. This is why Paul says, based on what you believe, 
about what I just told you in the first three chapters, what I just wrote you about who you are concerning who you are in Christ, if you believe that's who you are, that you're seated with him in heavenly places, that you have an inheritance of riches in Christ, then I urge you, I exhort you, I plead with you, please walk it like you talk it. He says, walk worthy of the calling you've received. This is so cool. Walk worthy of the calling you have received. This does not mean that we should try to earn or deserve our place in God's favor. But watch this. It means that we should recognize how much our place in God's favor deserves from us. How much God's favor on our life elicits a response. So the word worthy literally means to bring up the other beam of the scale. So if the scales are like this, he's saying worthy, walk worthy of that calling. Bring up the other beam. If you Walk in such a way that implies there's a balance between what you profess you believe and how we practice what we believe. Because there's, here's what he's saying. Right now, you're professing a lot, but your practice of what you profess is not lining up. So balance out that beam and walk worthy of the calling that's placed on your life. Walk out what you profess by what you practice. Also notice he says worthy of the calling that you have received. Not that you will receive or you are going to get one day. It's past tense. This is your position in Christ already. That's what he said. According to verse chapters 1, 2, and 3, this is who you are in Christ. Not if you obey, then I will bless you. That's the Old Testament way. That's the Old Covenant way, right? If God's people will do this, then you will get blessed. He's saying that's not how it is anymore. Because of Jesus, what he did on the cross, because of his shed blood, I've already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ it's done now in response to that my love and my grace and the riches of my inheritance obey me this is who you are so walk in that manner Paul's trying to tell us your activity is based on your identity who you are in Christ is affecting what you do for Christ. It's not what you do that makes you who you are, but who you are in Christ determines what you do. Your identity in Christ determines your calling, so balance it out and walk worthy of the calling that I've given you. And what is that calling? What's the calling that he's saying? Hey, I hear what y'all are saying. I hear what you're saying, but... You, Y'all got to balance the scale. What's that calling he's saying? To walk in the unity of the Spirit. Y'all talk about being a family. You talk about the church. You talk about loving one another. I hear all that. And man, y'all are preaching all of that. And wow, but y'all got to balance the scales. Y'all got to actually do what you're saying. Through the blood of Jesus, God has reconciled Jews and Gentiles to himself in Christ. And therefore, the only way that we can be reconciled together ourselves today is through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the one and only way God designed for all ethnic groups everywhere to be able to come to each other in peace. No matter if it's in the Ukraine or Russia or here in Columbia County, it doesn't matter. In essence, it's coming to God in Christ together no matter who you are or where you're from. Paul is saying that it's already a spiritual reality in Christ. So you have a responsibility in Christ to do what? To try to get it? To try, no, to guard it. It's already there. That's what he's saying. So guard it. Protect it. Preserve that unity. If there's ever a line, now it's an imaginary one because Jesus has already legally removed it by his blood on the cross. So when the enemy tries to redraw that dividing line in Christ as the church, we've got the responsibility to walk it like we talk it and cross that line. Now, verse 2 through 3, they're pretty straightforward. Paul is describing the grace of unity. See, unity is not uniformity. Unity is something that happens on the inside of us. It's a work of grace. Uniformity is something that is a result of external pressure. I'm going to make you like me. Unity is a work of grace that because of who we are in Christ is who we're becoming. Day by day, grace upon grace, transformed into his likeness 
This ought to take the pressure off of us. So here's what we can be encouraged about. Unity is a work of grace. Because it ain't a work of Brent. That's obvious. This should take the pressure off making something happen that you can't make happen. But what you can do is walk by grace, walk in faith in the one who has called us together, and trust God to make our relationships, all of them, God-honoring in every way. So Paul urges us, the church, to keep the unity of the Spirit, preserve it, protect it, guard it by walking in the Christian graces he lists out. Here's what I want to encourage you, church. It is your responsibility to keep the church unified. It's not my responsibility alone. You're to guard it. You're to protect it. You're to preserve it. It's already ours in Christ, so now it's your job to keep it. So this is what he says. How are we going to do that? By being completely humble and gentle, being patient, and bearing with one another in love. This is the grace, the graces, the Christian graces that you're going to walk out. The first is humility. As someone once said, humility is that grace that when you know you have it, you've lost it. All right, I'm waiting for some of y'all just to catch up. Anybody ever tell you that they're the most humble person that they know? Man, I'm the most humble person I know. Oh, are you now? That is wonderful. Brag about yourself much? True humility means Christ first, others second, self last. This word, the Greek, means lowliness of mind, which what means? It means I don't think so highly of myself that I've got no room to think of others more highly than me. See, if all I'm ever doing is thinking of myself most highly, there's no space for me to think more highly of others. I've crowded that out with everything being focused on me. And it's that type of person, we understand, that divides. You know that person that is their own hype man? Like they're going to hype themselves? Or every story that is told, even if it's yours, somehow it gets turned around and it ended up being about them? Pride is awful. And it's off-putting. But religious pride is disgusting to God. And it destroys unity. When we sit in lofty chairs and look down our noses at people, when we throw rocks from our glass houses at other people, when we look at other people's speck in their eye while we've got a big log protruding out of our own, Jesus says, you must repent and go look in the mirror and make sure that everything is right on the inside first before you start trying to go make sure everything's right on the outside next. But if we would humbly recognize the God-given worth of other people, then it will keep the walls of division down. Because you and I know it's easy to get along with humble people, isn't it? It just is. Whenever you meet a humble person, it is just so easy to get along with them because they respect you in a way that you deserve respect. And it's why humility is essential to unity. The reason we as Christians, here, I'll help us this morning. The reason that we can be lowly and humble of heart is because of the privilege that we have of knowing God. What do I mean? Well, when you know God is omniscient, in comparison, you realize how very little you know. I mean, like, when I realize that I'm in a relationship and I know him more, I go, I don't really know very much. So I can't be prideful about that. When you know how powerful, how almighty God is, how omnipotent God is, then in comparison, you know how very little strength you have. Well, I'm strong. And then when you realize how holy God is, the Holy One, you realize how lowly your righteousness is in comparison to His And the great delight of the lowly Christian is to enjoy the free, unmerited mercy and grace of God. All our longings are satisfied in God. God is the one that we esteem. God is our confidence. God is the one who will assert himself someday and vindicate the poor and make the last first. In the meantime, the person of lowliness who's humble of heart is the servant of all, following in the footsteps of our Savior. This is the first stage of love in our life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes to see the majesty of God's holiness and the minuteness of ourselves which causes us to walk in humility humble yourselves therefore before before the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you at the proper time 
Next, he says, be gentle. Or in some translations, it says, meek. Meekness is sometimes described as the gentleness of the strong or strength under control. It is power, but it's not power over others. It's power under others. It's support rather than pressure. It's the absence of the need to assert my personal rights with God or any other people. It's the power to lift people up, not hold them down. It's the power in a conversation to not have to be right every time, to not have to prove my point every time, to to actually be wrong and be okay with it, to not have to state my opinion when it's not going to help the situation. Christian lowliness, which we mentioned first, is a disposition to think lowly of ourselves and highly of Christ. So Christian meekness is the demeanor of a person with this disposition. And this gentle disposition is then coupled with patience or long-suffering. Oh, Lord. Have you ever said that? Oh, Lord, give me patience. Dumb prayer. (laughs) Super dumb prayer. Okay. I'll give you plenty of opportunities to grow in it. See, the kind of patience that, that, that Paul is talking about here is literally the ability to endure discomfort without fighting back. I mean, all of us have got a big L on that one, I think. Just go ahead and admit it right now. Repent right now where you are. You got a big L when it comes to enduring discomfort without fighting back. Being patient or long-suffering with someone who's more aggravating than a gnat in South Georgia on a hot summer's day. If y'all don't know how aggravating that is, then praise God you've missed out on that. Gnats are the most aggravating things because you're beating yourself in the face trying to kill them. In the ears, you barked your own ears, you poked your own eyes out, you've beat yourself in the nose, and they're still alive somewhere, making a noise. Maybe up in your na- nasal canal, out in your ear somewhere, in your mouth, in your teeth. Yeah, it's super aggravating. But think of it this way. Think of patience and long-suffering this way. This patience that Paul is talking about is patience towards aggravating people, just like God in Christ has shown tolerance towards your aggravating self. The more highly you think of yourself, then the more quickly you're going to be impatient and think that you should be served. Why do they think they are keeping me waiting like this? Do they know who I am? No, they don't. And even if they did, they don't care. But if you have a disposition of lowliness, which we already talked about, it won't feel so inappropriate when you're not treated like a dignitary. And when the fruits of your labors are slow in coming, if you have seen the majesty of God's holiness, you know your own minuteness and sinfulness, and you don't presume to deserve special treatment. And if you've seen the magnificence of God's grace, you know he will give you the strength to wait, to be patient, to be long-suffering, while being confident that God can turn all your delays into a strategic maneuver for your victory at some point. Patient means I've just got to wait for it. Along with being patient, Paul says, bear with one another in love. You could also use the word endure with one another. You want to know why the church isn't more unified than it is? Because we won't endure with one another. We're enduring so much in life that to endure with one another is just one more thing we're not willing to deal with. And yet Paul says, well, if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to be the church the way Jesus died for you to be the church, then you're going to have to bear with one another. This doesn't mean be besties. You can relax. It doesn't mean that you agree all the time. You can relax. It means that we endure one another in love. In my opinion, this is a fairly low bar, right? To endure something. To endure one another. Like, like I endure a 5K. I endure going to the dentist and get a root canal. I endure eating bad food. I endure stuff I don't like. And apparently Paul's saying, well, then you can endure one another. Endure one another. And here's the difference. You do it in love. That's the difference. I endure a long conversation that I don't really want to be in. Because I love you. I endure a matter that I think is trivial and you think is monumental. Because I love you. I endure the fact that you said something that hurt me and you don't even know it yet. And and I endure that because I love you and I want to work it out. Love covers a multitude 
of sins. I love them in Christ. And I'm so glad Paul said that you are to bear with or endure one another. Because why? It frees us from the hypocritical need to think I or anybody else in the church has got to be perfect. See, the moment that you think that's the case, then you've just climbed up in that high and lofty chair and started to look down in a way that the mirror would reveal completely otherwise. Perfect people don't exist. They don't exist anywhere. And perfect people don't need to be endured and forgiven. But guess what in Focus Church? We're a bunch of people that need to be endured and forgiven much, a lot, often. And if you're unwilling to endure with somebody or forgive somebody because you've got so much turmoil going on on the inside of you, then you need to repent and ask God to forgive you and heal you from the inside so that you can endure and bear with one another on the outside. He knows all of you. And the Apostle Paul is saying this not in a vacuum, right? He knows what's going on. He knows how these people are acting. God knows that the pastor of In Focus Church can be temperamental. He knows that he's not nearly as Christ-like as he wants to be. And he also knows every single one of you in every area of your life where you, where you fall short or fail. He knows all of that. And yet he says, endure with one another for peace sake. His exhortation is not how perfect people can live together in unity, but how real, imperfect, jacked up, different, diverse, unique people at In Focus Church can maintain the unity of spirit. Namely how? By enduring each other in love. I love you too much not to endure. That's really what we should be saying. I love you too much to not endure through this. And I'm not talking about abuse. Come on, I'm not talking about stupid stuff that's wrong and sinful. I'm talking about enduring with one another through difficulties and disagreements and hurts and wounds and things like that that we can work through through the reconciling power of Jesus. Bearing with one another together to what? Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of spirit. I don't know if there's one word to describe that grace, but it's endeavor. Make every effort, endeavor, strive, struggle, labor, toil, aspire to keep the unity of the spirit. And syntax matters here because this is a present participle verb, meaning that you have to constantly, it's ongoing that we're striving to maintain unity, that we're endeavoring to maintain unity. Whether it's the church, my marriage, my house, my kids, my job, my my friends, I'm laboring, I'm struggling, I'm striving, and it never ends to maintain that unity. And the minute that you think it's good and that you can rest and stop, that's the minute that Satan will sneak in and try to destroy it all. Because yeah. that's what he wants to do. So what is the unity of the Spirit? Sounds great. What is it? Well, the text shows that in a decisive act of atonement and reconciliation, Christ made us one. Already. Here's another one of the mysteries of, if you will, Christianity. It's the already Christ has made us one and the not yet because we sure don't look like we're one. But already Paul's saying at Calvary, Jesus accomplished something that we should maintain, guard, protect, persevere, and preserve by the Spirit. But in another sense, the unity Christ purchased and guaranteed with his blood must now be actually lived out in the flesh, in real time, brought to full expression where? In the life of the church, in the body of those who claim to be believers. So in this sense, it's a goal to be attained. So the unity of the Spirit is both maintained, it's already happened in Christ, but we've got to attain it as the church in Christ so that we don't re-erect and rebuild walls and dividing lines that Jesus lived legally by his blood, has already destroyed. So Paul is saying we have common convictions about Jesus Christ, common confidence of who we are in Christ, and common care for one another because of Christ in us. And then we go back to verse 2 and we see how we maintain this unity, which is what we just said. And let's be honest, none of this is normative to our human condition, our human nature. We're not normally humble and gentle and patient and all of that. But they are a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in those who belong to Jesus to make us completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. And then the final grace 
is the grace of peace. We are to be peacemakers, and Paul tells us to keep the bond of peace. There's a bond of peace that Jesus has made. Now keep it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit How? Through the bond of peace. And be aware that if you yourself do not have peace with God, then you will not ever have lasting peace with other people. The reason for war on the outside is because of first a war that's going on on the inside. Have you ever been in those conversations with somebody where you're like, man, there's something way more going on here than what we're actually fighting about? There's something way deeper than what we're actually arguing about right this second. There's an internal war going on that has now manifested itself into an external battle with somebody, and this isn't all that's going on. So if a believer cannot get along with God and let him rest and still the turmoil in storms inside of us internally, then he or she will not be able to get along with other believers ever. I love how Colossians 3.15 puts it. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. See, peace isn't just for you to have peace of mind. Peace isn't just for me just to, well, I got peace in my heart, peace in my soul. No, this peace rules and reigns in all of our hearts because we're called to one unified body. That's the peace that we're to protect. That's the bond that we have. It's a piece of people together, which leads to the final and we find the spiritual foundation of unity. Unity is a work of grace, but here's the spiritual foundation of that unity. Paul gives us the basic spiritual realities that have to unite all believers for all time for lasting true unity. Unity on anything other than these biblical truths is a foundation that will not stand the storms of life. They will not stand the dividing lines that get rebuilt. They will not stand the divisions that are going to come. They will not stand the attacks of the enemy that will come to pull us apart. So he says, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father. This is the objective foundation of all of our efforts to preserve the unity of the Spirit. It's not a fragile thing. It's a very solid thing. And it rests on the oneness of God, on the oneness of faith, and on the oneness of baptism and the body. These things are one no matter what you or I do. These are fixed realities in Christ. Our task is is to walk worthy of them. See, no matter what we do, we're not changing the fact that there is one God, one faith, one body. But we're going to walk worthy of that so we can be a part of that one God, one faith, one spirit, one body. Balance it out. Walk worthy of the calling. So let's just mention them. Because as the church, they're foundational to our beliefs, and then we'll close. One body. What does that mean? It's the body of Christ composed of every believer, no matter of their ethnicity, ethnicity, background, nation, or tongue. We are all equal. We are all one. Period. Pretty simple. One body for all who profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord all over the world. That's why I love the song we just sang, Without Borders, a moment ago. That's who our God is. One body. By what? By one spirit. This happens by the power of one spirit. The same Holy Spirit that indwells every believer. So consequently, we belong to each other in the Lord. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Without the Holy Spirit at work in us, being one body is an impossibility. That's why we need one spirit. Then we have one hope. This hope isn't just for a good day. Isn't that how we often, Lord, I just hope I have a good day. That's not the hope that this is talking about. Hope in the Bible is the hope about what is going to happen when Christ's return. It's the hope in the return of Christ. It's the hope of our salvation. It's the hope of glory, the Bible calls it, of every believer. Paul is saying, if you understand the reality of one body and you walk in that one spirit and you're eagerly awaiting the one hope of the Lord's return, then you're going to be a peacemaker or one who is protecting the bond of peace and the unity in the church. Then he says, one Lord. 
We all have the same Lord Jesus Christ who took our place on the cross and died in our place and who is now seated at the right hand of God the Father interceding on our behalf and is coming again to take us home one day. So how can two believers claim to obey the same Lord and then be at such odds? I don't have an answer for that. But I know, what, I know that it happens. And I know Paul says that it shouldn't be that way. But acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives is to be foundational. It's a foundation stone of our unity. Then he says one faith. This one faith is the settled body of truth deposited by Christ into his church. It's what we believe. It's the body of truth held by believers everywhere as taught by the apostles and now taught today through God's word. It's the gospel and all of its implications as it invades every part of our life and everything that we do. As one commentary defines it, here in this verse, one faith indicates the content of the message taught by the apostles and held in common by all Christians rather than the personal exercise of trust by a believer. It's one faith that we all have in common. One baptism. Now this doesn't mean that we all got dunked at the same time or in the same water. That would be gross. I was mentioned in the first service, I remember Carla, one of our trips to Memphis and they went to a restaurant and one of their claims to fame was they were still using the same grease that they've been using for a century. Now some of y'all think, they even, when they we moved locations, they took the grease with them in an armored car caravan is that important i'm like bro that sounds kind of gross I i'm gonna tell you right now a century's worth of grease in the sound boy but we're not all baptized in the same water but here's what this means it means that we're baptized in the same holy spirit this would be the act of the holy spirit when he places the believing sinner into the body of christ at salvation that's the work of the holy spirit so we all have that one baptism of the holy spirit and then we have one God and Father because of that, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the intimate reality of our relationship with one another because God is the Father of every single one of us. If we're brothers and sisters and we're all in the same family, then what Paul is saying is, well, then you ought to be able to walk in unity together. And then get this, because there's a side where you go, well, that's cool. We're, wow, look at us. We're, we're unified and we're, we're diverse and we're, we're trying to be unified. And isn't that great? And that's wonderful. But amazingly, this is not just what our, we're doing it for unity's sake. It's also our mission. The foundation for both unity and mission. The uniqueness of Christ, the fact that there's only one Christ and only one God and only one faith is the foundation for our mission outside these four walls. And it's also the foundation of unity inside the church. We're called to live as one, be one, and then we're called to take that unity that we have in Christ together to a world around us that is desperate because they're dying through division. We see this all over the world, church. And I just want to encourage you today, this is who you are. Paul is saying, this is who you are. Now this is how you're going to walk this out. You're going to be gentle, humble. You're going to be gentle. You're going to be patient. And you're going to, you're going to bear with one another. If I could just encourage you, all of you in this room right now, or maybe watching or listening later on, please bear with one another. Please endure with one another. If you really love Jesus and you really love that person like you say you do, because I can't tell you how many times I've heard say, man, I love you, but, man, I love you, but, see ya. Man, I really do love you. I really do think a lot of you, but I'm out. If you really love Jesus and you really love one another, let's bear with one another and let the unity of Christ be a manifest witness to the people around us of who God is to make us one. Here's the last thing I'll encourage you and then I'm going to pray. I think there's a lot of discussion in the church at large about what we used to be like before COVID hit. I'm not just my, we've said it here. They said, it, well, what, what's the church like? Well, I mean, are you talking pre-COVID or are you talking post-COVID? I really felt like the Lord encouraged me this week when I was praying. I was walking around in here early in the morning praying, and he's like, I'm going to take this place from being about a discussion of what you were pre-COVID to who you are in Christ post-pruning. 
And what I mean by that is God, as we said before, he prunes everything that he loves. It's actually what any healthy gardener would do. And as he prunes the church worldwide and nationwide, and that's really happened all over the nation, it's going to be so we're not talking about what we used to be, but we're talking about who we are in Christ. One body, one spirit. One faith, one baptism, one Father and Lord over all. That's who you are in focus. That's who you are right now. And our greatest days are still ahead of us as we continue to bear with one another and live this out.